Hi, Troy. Thanks for coming back on the program. It's good to talk to you again. Hope you're uh, doing well over in the uh, UK. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to be back, uh, Henrik. Always enjoy uh, being on the show and uh, looking forward to it. Definitely. It's always a lot of fun, a lot of big uh, questions and big themes. We're going to get to some of those today as well. We also have uh, Ted with us, of course, uh, your co-author. Thanks for coming on with us uh, today, Ted. Good to have you with us. My pleasure. Now, you know, before we get into the main topic here, uh, you know, the meat of the discussion, I thought we'd just spend a, a few minutes or so on, on your background, Ted, since you're new to the program. We could just kind of introduce you a little bit to our audience. I was just curious to hear briefly about the the math work that you've been doing re in regards to uh, you know, dinosaurs, uh, gravity, and basically some of these unanswered uh, questions. Tell us just li a little bit about this, Ted. Okay, everything that I've ever done along these lines, you know, amounts to hobby shop uh, projects. Uh, I mean, I I've earned my living as a, as a computer software developer. You can't, you can't be in a position where your livelihood depends on any sort of an academic thing and take some of the positions I've taken, right? You either have to be independently wealthy or you have to be doing something else for a living. Um, as far as studying gravity and dinosaurs, basically that goes back to the early 80s. And you, what I had come up with at that time was the fact that you could simply use the kinds of scaling which they use for Olympic weightlifting events to get a ballpark figure for, for a size limit for the planet. You know, in other words, there, there, there's a problem that you get into uh, as you get larger, right? I mean, you, you'll remember from school, it was always the littlest kid in your classroom who could do the most push-ups or pull-ups or any kind of a ratio exercise. You know, and that is because, you know, weight is proportional to volume, which is a cubed figure, and strength is proportional to cross-section of bones and muscles, which is a squared figure. If you were to double your physical dimensions, then you've got a factor of two, which gets figured three times for volume and weight, width, breadth, height, two, four, eight, you're going to be eight times heavier. But that factor of two only gets squared for cross-section and for strength, right? You're only going to be four times stronger. You'll have cut your power-to-weight ratio in half. And obviously, you can only cut your power-to-weight ratio in half so many times and still stand up and walk. And it is possible to figure a mathematical limit for that sort of thing for the planet. In other words, you can simply use the two-thirds power body weight scaling factor, which is used for Olympic lifting events. And you, you can simply solve for the point at which one of our strongest human athletes would become dysfunctional due to this um, the square cube problem in the case of a like one of your world's strongest man competitors or a power lifter like Kazmaier or Mark Chalet or somebody like that then you can simply figure you know okay take a um, thousand pound squat or deadlift figure weight is going to be equal to you know, the 1,000 pounds plus the 350 pounds of the athlete, divide that by the two-thirds power of 350 pounds and simply set that equal to a person just lifting himself up off the ground, X divided by the two-thirds power of X and solve for X. So if you get a number right around 20,000 pounds, that would be the extreme mathematical limit for the planet. Now, in actual reality, the largest elephants are about... 14,000, 15,000 pounds, and that's like 1% of elephants. And it's probably the case that when an elephant gets to that size, that he has to stay on his feet for the rest of his life. If he gets off of his feet at that point, he's not going to get back upon them. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. This says that, you know, this is the real world limit for uh, our present world, right? In other words, there, there would be a question which says that if you look at dinosaurs and their sizes, uh, and that those sizes were supposed to be such a winning ticket for creatures which dominated the Earth for tens of millions of years, then you've got a question as to why within the, the 65 million years, which supposedly separates their age from ours, nothing else has ever re-evolved to those sizes. You know, the answer is simply that they can't. In other words, if you were to give Steven Spielberg a... Um, a time machine and allow him to drag one of your large sauropod dinosaurs into the parking lot or, or the street, I mean, you wouldn't start walking around chasing people. It would collapse in a heap and it'd suffocate, uh, really, is all that would happen. It wouldn't take <laughs> a couple of minutes. Right. Okay, it's exactly the same thing that happens if a whale gets beached or somebody, for some reason, drags a blue whale up onto land and suffocates, right? I mean, he can't even support the weight of his own lungs. That's incredible. So just to clarify that for listeners who doesn't understand maybe just the math alone behind that, the point there is that something must have been different with the gravity if we go back in time. Is that, is that what this is pointing to? 
That's correct. In other words, there's no way to believe that large dinosaurs experience gravity the way that we do at all. You know, they'd be crushed by our present gravity. There are other kinds of problems. I mean, you have thousand-pound flying creatures in the ancient world. The, the largest creatures which can take off the land on our present world are 25, 30 pounds. You know, albatrosses and um, barracuda eagles, right? Those kinds of things. But, I mean, that's about the limit. You know, they've tried to breed barracudas for size and strength for thousands of years, and the largest they can get them up to is about 25 pounds. Beyond that point, they can't take off easily. Hmm. Um, you had territories in ancient times which were like a 200-pound golden eagle, you know, with a 25-foot wingspan. Then you've got these Texas Big Bend pterosaurs, which, you know, appear to have been in the neighborhood of 1,000 pounds, wingspans 50, 60 feet. You know, if, if you're built like that, I mean, they have to live by flying. You, you can't have wings like that and just walk around. You know, that, that's not a reasonable lifestyle. I mean, in fact, in other words, the birds who, the surviving large birds, you know, which made it past the change in gravity, did so by having the wings become vestigial, like ostriches, moas. Right. You know, those kinds of things, right? It's like they don't fly, but, you know, they're not dragging 50-foot wings around either. Yeah, it's a f fascinating point. I think many haven't uh, thought about it that before, and I'm sure that these uh, ideas, of course, is something that we'll tie into later in our discussion. Mm -hmm. Now, if we if we shift our focus then to uh, Cosmos in Collision, a prehistory of our solar system, our planet, and of modern man, uh, there is some really interesting and big points here. And, uh, and Troy, there, there are a lot of you know somewhat complicated themes in the book, and, and I think it would be good to just do a uh, a broad stroke outline here, an overview, if you will, in the beginning of some of the bigger questions that you guys are, are trying to answer. To, uh, so let's uh, get to it. Yeah, well, um, I sort of got to know Ted. Uh, I, I knew of him before he actually contacted me after I'd released uh, the Saturn Death Cult uh, book, which gives an introduction to a theory called Saturn Theory. And uh, Ted had contacted me specifically to do with uh, the more ancient uh, aspects of that theory, the... Um, cosmology involved in that, but I knew of his work through uh, the works of Eduardo Cardona, one of the um, main advocates of uh, Saturn theory who's put out a number of books. So it was quite a pleasant surprise to, um, uh, you know, to come into contact with Ted, and uh, over time we started to develop some very interesting discussions that uh, led to a decision that we would uh, you know, co-author a book. Um, Cosmos and Collision that was uh, written mainly as an investigation into the question of human origins in the uh, context of Saturn theory. Now, to understand what brought me and Ted together, uh, one, un one has to understand what Saturn theory is and how Saturn theory relates to the question of human origins. When Ted contacted me, he was most interested in the element of uh, Saturn theory relating to a time uh, dubbed the Purple Dawn of Creation. This was a semi-nocturnal era when the uh, world was reputedly bathed in a permanent, never-changing purple-hued glow. And for those listeners who might not know what Saturn theory is, Saturn theory is basically a subset of the electric universe model that uh, proposes a new physics for the universe based on electrical forces and not just gravitational forces. This uh, Saturn theory subset um, first developed uh, mostly from the reinterpretations of the mythological record, which identify the planet Saturn as having once been Earth's original sun, long before the appearance of our current sun, and the idea being that uh, Earth was originally a satellite of Saturn, uh, when that planet was a sub brown dwarf star, and that both Saturn and Earth were eventually and catastrophically uh, captured by the sun. Uh, an event witnessed by humans and recorded as uh, the main events that have come down to us today as the golden age of mythology. Now, while there are a number of developing versions of Saturn theory, most concentrate on events uh, after the proposed capture of Saturn and Earth and uh, it's, uh, the Saturn's eventual banishment uh, to the outer realms of the solar system where we see it today. Um, according to the theory, uh, these events are recorded in world mythology, as I've noted before, as the uh, Golden Age or the Era of the Gods. However, there was a time um, reported uh, to be an almost ageless period uh, before this Golden Age, where some of the earliest oral traditions remember a permanent semi-nocturnal existence for humankind, uh, a time when there was no sun or moon and humans could not accurately calculate the passage of time. 
The only source of light during this darkened epoch, it seems, uh, was said to have been a pale stationary disk that hung in the, uh, the skies, uh, sorry, hung in the sky at Earth's celestial north where the pole star can be seen today. Uh, that pale disk later erupted into a brilliant light, only uh, to eventually dull and fall away um, with the appearance or the coming of today's sun. But before this event, there was only a dull darkness, a nocturnal environment, uh, and that pale di disk, which was Saturn, um, this is what Saturn theory uh, advocates, advocates have uh, come to dub as the purple dawn of creation. So what we find is this so-called purple dawn was, of course, the time when Saturn drifted through space on its own, as its own planetary um, uh, system, with Earth and some satellites in tow, uh, including Mars, Neptune, and uh, Uranus. And uh, Saturn is identified as having been a brown dwarf star at this time that was slowly spiraling through space on its fateful uh, collision course with the Sun. At uh, this time, the whole Saturnian system was encased in Saturn's opaque uh, plasma sheath, an electrical uni electric universe concept uh, uh, relating to the uh, electrical co cocoon that surrounds uh, uh, electrically charged celestial bodies. And this did not allow outside light or other stars to be seen by inhabitants on the Earth, which is the reason there seems to be no way to calculate time and the reason there was such a dull... Uh, nocturnal glow on Earth uh, for that period. Where the question of human origins comes into the equation is that there seems to have been two intelligent species during this Purple Dawn era on Earth, uh, one that was highly adapted to the semi-nocturnal conditions, uh, while the other uh, was almost uh, seemingly helpless in this darkened environment. Mm, yeah. These two species coexisted together uh, during this time, uh, one being uh, what we, we identify as the Neanderthal hominid, the other being Homo sapiens, a, uh, or modern man, or as we know them from that period, uh, some people know them by the term Cro-Magnons. And of the two, it seems Neanderthals uh, were the, to have been basically superbly adapted uh, to this Purple Dawn era, while the um, Cro-Magnons appear to have been singularly ill-adapted. Uh, while there has been an attempt to humanize Neanderthals uh, over time, uh, that is to reconstruct them as looking almost human, there is a new and uh, controversial wave of thinking that has led to Neanderthal constructions, particularly by the evolutionist Danny Vandramini. Mm -hmm, yeah. um, and this, uh, this work that Danny Vandramini has done produces an entirely different cre uh, type of creature to the one that we often see in popular um, you know, uh, representations of Neanderthals. Uh, and uh, basically it resembles uh, more of a highly intelligent ape hominid than a type of prototype human. And so when Ted and I first started talking about Saturn theory in this nocturnal purple dawn era, we found ourselves faced with uh, two conundrums. The first being what type of physics could account for a relationship between the planet Earth and its original host star Saturn, where the host star is seen to sit in a, in a stationary position at the celestial North Pole. And uh, the second conundrum uh, being how to account for the presence of, hu of uh, modern humans in a nocturnal environment where they were so obviously ill-adapted to the conditions. And it was a second conundrum uh, that was brought about largely when Ted started making insightful observations on the visual capacity of human eyes to operate in this nocturnal environment, which forced us, and, and particularly myself, to accept the strong possibility, if not the outright plausibility, that human beings are simply not native to Earth. Uh, what we mean to point out is that uh, any native creature to any environment uh, would be expected to be adapted to that external environment. Uh, this is true whether you're a believer in uh, evolutionary concepts or uh, creational you know, concepts uh, regards the coming of mankind. But in, uh, this journey in writing Cosmos and Collision really be began when Ted started asking questions about human eyes and their ability, or we should say lack of ability, to see in the dark which were the conditions facing modern humans when they first appeared on Earth, um, according mm. to Saturn theory. Well, uh, why don't we get there and, and talk a little bit more about that, Ted, and have you back in, in here. And just uh, uh, what were some of the points that you, that you, that you realized and, and, and kind of break down this difference, if you will, uh, for people that, that uh, you know, haven't thought about this before? A lot of this starts with just the question of Neanderthals, which has always struck me as one of the more interesting questions that you get into with ancient history. Like, what exactly were Neanderthals? I mean, 
there was a big article in Discover in 1996, James Shreve, but it's called the Neanderthal Peace, which indicated that, that one of the biggest mysteries that, that they faced was the fact that there was no evidence whatsoever of, of crossbreeding between humans and Neanderthals on the planet. You know, and this was funny because because of the fact that the Neanderthal is normally presented as just a slightly different human. You know, it's like you would expect, you know, particularly in a place like the Levant, where the two groups appear to have been in, in close proximity to each other for long periods of time, you would expect there to be a great deal of evidence of, of crossbreeding, but there just wasn't any. Okay, uh, and that was a sort of a mystery. Um, you started getting Neanderthal DNA analyses, like in the late 90s, and it turned out that Neanderthal DNA was being described as being almost exactly halfway between ours and that of chimpanzee. Okay, now that's not just a racial difference. I mean, at that point, you're talking about a species difference. Yeah. You're talking about some kind of a really big, serious difference, right? Now, they have, you know, real footprints of Neanderthals coming from, I believe, Croatia, right? Uh, and... There's one of those available in the Museum of Natural History in Prague, che Czechoslovakia. Uh, and, you know, this is, I mean, it's not exactly an ape's footprint, but you or I couldn't go out and find mud and make a footprint like that. I mean, it's about halfway between, you know, one of our footprints and one of theirs. The feet appear to be shorter. It's like the big toe goes out from the foot. Uh, I mean, no human ever made a footprint like that. And so one of the questions I'd been wondering about for a number of years was, you know, you know, what do these things actually look like? I mean, you know, with DNA like that, that they have fur coats, right? And then these images of Danny Vendermeenies came out, like in 2011. Okay, and I've been looking at those for some time, and that's just stunning. Okay, I mean, that just completely changes the game as far as, like, what exactly Neanderthals were and, you know, what, if anything, our relationship to them could have been. I mean... Danny Vendermeening is, is claiming that the Neanderthal was basically a type of a primate, that they had the same six-inch-long Ice Age fur coat as every other Ice Age animal. They were the absolute apex, apex predator of the European Ice Age. You're talking about walking around in extreme cold on a very regular basis. Um, you know, without the six-inch-long fur coat, you'd be in a world of hurt. Um, hmm. They apparently were able to make tools, um, spear points, chippers, scrapers, hand axes, things of that nature. But they weren't clever or inventive like humans are. It's like they're, they're in the entire period of their, their existence on Earth, their, their basic toolkit never changed. You know, what was the toolkits of Cro-Magnon man just went through gigantic changes in a very short period of time. Um, you know, that the Neanderthal had a larger brain than modern humans and you have to ask yourself, I mean, if you've got some kind of a creature with a bigger brain than ours living here for like 200,000 200, years or 300,000 years, the least you should find is Neanderthal cities, right? But there aren't any. And you've had articles recently indicating that uh, most of the Neanderthal brain was taken up with the parts of the brain which deal with vision, Right, and if you assume that this creature is also adapted to this dark world which you've just heard Troy describe, you know, this Purple Dawn world, then what you really have to, to believe is that the Neanderthal brain was mainly the neurological equivalent of the circuitry for a military night vision scope. Hmm. Okay, yeah. the, thing that, the, the, the most major thing which jumps out at you in these reconstructions of Danny Vandermeen is, is the eyes. Okay, I mean, the Neanderthal was just a fabulously bug-eyed creature. I mean, their eye sockets are twice the size of ours. And you've actually got other kinds of analyses on the Internet. This uh, Rob Gargett, the, what does he call himself, the renegade archaeologist or something like that at any rate, he's noted that if you were to try to draw a more human-like Neanderthal with the eyes and the nose as large as the bones indicate they would have to be, what you end up with, with is still outlandish. Okay, you end up with a human with, with eyes double or two and a half times the size of ours. Okay. Mm. So, I mean, I've been absorbing all of this for a period of time, and then you had an article or a couple of articles appearing in the summer of 2012, which indicated that dinosaurs all had these same kinds of eyes. You know, th these articles were called, uh, I can't remember the exact name, but a lot like dinosaurs dealing with the dark. 
Okay, and not just predators, but herbivores as well. Apparently all dinosaurs have these same kinds of eyes. And at that point, I went looking around the internet, just, you know, the, the, doing Google searches on, on, on big eyes, large eyes, you know, like, you know, what exactly can, can you say about animals which have, have you know, larger eyes that, than anything which you normally ever see anymore? It turns out that a number of the very old families of creatures for our planet, some of which are still with us, have these same kinds of eyes, so lemurs, tarsiers, bush babies. Okay, but they were all the old, you know, in other words, these were all the creatures which were living in this Purple Dawn Age, which Troy has spoken of. At that point, something dawned on me, you, you know, that I'd been looking at something the wrong way as far as humans. I mean, I've been studying these images which have been coming back from Mars for the last dozen years or so. And if you were going to, you know, in other words, if you were to assume that humans came from somewhere other than this planet, the first thing that you would look to would be Mars. I mean, just because of these megalithic structures, the fact that you've got, you know, the remains of, of what appear to be cities and villages on Mars, I mean, aside from megalithic structures. You know, in other words, Mother Nature doesn't do straight lines or Bezier curves on a three-mile scale. You've got things on Mars which don't happen in nature. Okay, I would have assumed that, you know, and, and in fact, for some time had been assuming that humans had come from Mars originally. But this whole thing with the eyes blew that out of the water. In other words, you know, I finally said to myself, you know, you're looking at this the wrong way. There's no, I mean, Mars would have been living in the same dark world that the Earth was in. It's like, you know, humans simply couldn't have come from the Earth or from Mars. You've got to look somewhere else, right? What's the next thing you look at? Well, you know, you could think in terms of cosmic space, right, or, or, or humans having arrived here from, from some other star system. But, I mean, that's terribly hard to believe. You know, when you get to the kinds of distances which you would have to travel even to get to the very nearest stars and the amounts of time it would take to try to achieve such a thing. I mean, you know, I would assume normally that, that interstellar space is, if it ever goes on at all in the universe, goes on for two reasons only, information and escape, right? I mean, in other words, there, there, there's, no easy, it, there's no easy way to believe that humans would have gotten here from, from cosmic space. I mean, that would be a zero probability event. What other sort of a bright thing, a place could humans possibly have come from which is closer by than that? And the, the only answer there is was, you know, the bright part of our own solar system. I mean, whatever our present sun, Jupiter, Mercury, whatever was going on in that part of the, the, the cosmos in ancient times pretty much has to be where modern humans came from. I, I had um, basically written up a web page you know, to put out there on Barefoot Beak just for Troy. I mean, I never told anybody else about it. I said, Troy, I said, you've got to look at this. I mean, th this is basically a conjecture at this point, but it's starting to look to me like humans simply could not have come from this Saturnian part of the ancient system. They have to have come from the bright part of it. You know, yeah. that means that they probably came from, from some kind of a thing that was orbiting, you know, the sun in, in prehistoric times, but which no longer exists. In other words, which has been blown up or, or disappeared since then. You know, so it didn't occur to me uh, at that point in time that, that we would be able to come up with anything which would serve as a candidate for an original human homeland. But then something happened. Uh, an idea came along here. What we're basically talking about is that we see two different types of creatures that have developed. We can see the evidence for that on the Earth today. Uh, the modern world we have is, is a bright world compared to the purple dawn of creation. But separate then to this, we have the problem basically of human origins and where where we come from is we if we're not uh, completely adapted to the the purple dawn the, the conditions of course in our world today has has changed and we we'll, uh, you know that's something we've talked about with Troy before in terms of uh, saturn theory and and this uh, ign when when saturn ignites pretty much and and we have a different system but uh, Troy let's shift over then and see what we have on the on the other side of things if we have the purple dawn system we're talking about a completely different system also. Uh, is this something that at that point is part of our solar system, Troy, or how do we explain that? Well, what happened uh, when, when Ted and I were, um, before we even thought about writing the book, we were going back and forth over uh, the possibility that because um, Saturn theory identifies Mars as part of the original Saturnian system of uh, planets, uh, we looked at Mars as having been closer to Saturn and you know, could that have been a brighter world to account for um, uh, you know the, the, you know what we see in humans as adaptability to bright light environment? Uh, but um, of course, in the scheme of the of, of, of the sub-round dwarf being um, the original host star, 
uh, you, by getting close to the star, you don't actually get an intensity of light uh, increasing. Uh, you, you might get an intensity of energy in, the electrical, uh, uh, in, in an electrical environment, i.e., Mars would probably have been just as dark uh, as Earth would have been under, uh, you know, under such a, um, an arrangement uh, with Saturn. So, yeah, we were faced um, with this idea that uh, either the brightness, you, you know, was before um, the Purple Dawn, there was a bright period, uh, which we chucked out immediately simply because, uh, as Ted has uh, pointed out, dinosaurs are much more ancient creatures we're all perfectly adapted to the nocturnal wo world that Saturn theory calls you know, the purple dawn. So, you know, humans, uh, with possibly the ex exception of uh, dolphins, are the absolute least adapted um, creatures on this uh, planet to such an environment. And it was a, it was a total anomaly uh, that we were faced with. Yeah. So what happened was, um, uh, we, you know, we looked at the equation and uh, we, we looked at the problems uh, involved in, you know, travel through space, as Ted has talked about, how if humans m weren't native, how did they arrive on Earth? And uh, the, first of all, the, the, um, it, we started on the journey when we started asking the question, well, what was happening in the solar system around the sun before the arrival of uh, Saturn uh, and its uh, planets and satellites that were in, in its tow? And uh, was there a possibility that there might have been a world uh, in that system uh, that uh, conformed um, to, you know, an environment that was more suitable for um, uh, humans to have developed or created or whatever you want to use as your uh, mode, uh, but certainly more suitable to the kind of visual capacity that, uh, that humans have even to this day. And, uh, yeah, it was, um, it was that question uh, that uh, led us to ask some serious questions as to Basically, what did the solar system look like before Saturn first arrived? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, was there a possibility that we could uh, find a, uh, a place of origin for, um, for a human-type species? And what did you find? What did it point to? Well, um, the, it pointed definitely to uh, the, the idea that um, uh, we had a world that uh, if the conditions were different before the arrival of Saturn... Uh, that could quite easily be a liquid world with an oxygen environment, uh, which of course is what um, you know cosmologists and people uh, who are looking for uh, alien life or off-world life have always been looking for that kind of condition. You need liquid water. You need uh, um, you don't necessarily need an oxygen environment, but if uh, humans were involved, you certainly would need an oxygen environment. Uh, but you you need a world uh, with with at least these two. Um, uh, you know, traits uh, to them, and the the idea of a, a liquid world, of course, means that it has to be warm enough. And what they did was, uh, for myself, um, uh, you know, Ted had sort of led me to go off and see, you know, is, is there possibly anything that indicates in our solar system as it is today something within travel distance, so to speak, uh, that could have once been uh, such a world and. Yes, we did find that uh, given the data coming in from um, the search for what's called exoplanets, uh, that's the planets that are, are, are circling around other stars that are the same as our star, i.e. other main sequence stars, we found that there is a model that um, actually uh, shows that um, the norm in the universe is for planets the size of Jupiter to exist much closer to their uh, existing star uh, than we see Jupiter uh, today, and this, of course, is completely at odds with the uh, with uh, theories of how uh, planets form. But we find that these Jupiter-sized planets uh, do, in fact, exist closer in, and uh, because such planets would probably harbor moons of a terrestrial rocky type, uh, just as Jupiter does, uh, the, if Jupiter were in fact close in, uh, in in the time before the arrival of Saturn then the moons of Jupiter become extremely interesting uh, because that puts, um, puts them also close enough to the sun where we can expect, expect a, a liquid environment uh, to uh, take place. And the reason we would uh, expect that is because uh, the four Galilean moons, as they're called, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and uh, Callisto, um, of, of them, three of them are ice moons. 
and uh, you know they kept in their ice-like stasis, uh, uh, stasis uh, largely because of the frigid environment they now have. They are outside of what's called the frost line uh, in a uh, in the solar system. Put them inside the frost line, and things become very very interesting uh, regards the possibility of uh, these moons to support life as we know it. Yeah, that's a, I mean that's a fascinating theory in itself, uh, proposing that we might have. A moon here, basically, of Jupiter being once in a liquid state with with water on it and and uh, even oxygen atmosphere, you know, basically fully mm. capable of supporting life. So, w yeah. what explain to us just a little bit more then about how that system must have looked if that was to be a, a possibility, Troy? Well, in Cosmos and Collision, Ted um, coined the term antique solar system to describe this uh, solar system. As I say, it's a, it's a solar system without Saturn, without Uranus, without Neptune, without Earth, and without Mars, and also at that time without Venus. So that basically leaves us with uh, Jupiter, Mercury, and Pluto as the known planets. And, uh, of course, what we find um, with uh, regards to this is that uh, uh, particularly Mercury and Jupiter uh, have exactly almost, you know, uh, have the same axial tilt or lack of axial tilt um, as the Sun indicating that they you know, have an origin that is closely tied with the Sun as opposed to the, um, uh, the tilts of the other planets uh, that we've identified as being alien to the system. Uh, now, if we have just Jupiter uh, in a relationship with uh, the Sun, and if that conforms to what we are now seeing at an increasingly frequent uh, rate uh, amongst exoplanets uh, in, you know, that, that we're... Um, uh, that we're finding in the outer realms of uh, the galaxy and so on uh, like that, then, as I said before, it's, it seems the norm that uh, these types of planets operate much closer in. And because Jupiter um, itself, like Saturn, shows traits of having possibly been a sub-brown dwarf or a brown dwarf star, and because it's very, very difficult for astronomers often to tell the difference between a brown dwarf star, what constitutes a brown dwarf star, and what constitutes a gas giant planet. Uh, this fact that we're finding such objects in close proximity to their host stars uh, indicates that, uh, yes, definitely Jupiter would have um, been uh, much closer in uh, than it is today, uh, probably would have enjoyed a life as a full-fledged uh, brown dwarf or at least a sub-brown dwarf star, and therefore would have emanated uh, its own heat and uh, it, any terrestrial bodies, um, which we see today around them, for instance, the four Galilean moons, would have, in fact, been bathed in a much warmer light, both from uh, the sun and from Jupiter itself. And, uh, and basically, uh, you get the conditions that completely facilitate, uh, spectacularly so, uh, the conditions for um, the supporting of their life. I think what a lot of people are asking themselves at this point is, wait a minute, so are the guys saying that basically modern humans developed um, to, to a tremendous technological state and managed to take rockets over to Earth and then we forgot all about it? Or how do we, how do we solve this problem, Troy, of, of if there is two ah, different yeah. developments, mm -hmm. two different strands here of, of, of life, basically, how does one sure. get to the other? Let's talk about it. Well, okay, so if we, if we assume that you've got a, a situation where uh, you have um, a human existence, uh, and we'd probably need to talk more about Ganymede itself, because that is the moon that uh, Ted and I uh, you know, identified um, as the most likely moon for you know, the possible existence of humans um, you know, prior to their arrival on Earth, as we're talking about, you know, or at least just simply for the existence of life. Uh, we've identified Ganymede as that particular moon. But if you have, uh, you know, human life there, i.e. humans that are as intelligent as us, uh, as, as we are today, maybe with different technologies or whatever, yes, the mechanism by which there is a transfer to a, another terrestrial body that is literally invading the system from without, uh, you know, then that's where things become uh, highly speculative. In, in Cosmos and Collision, we offer a couple of um, uh, scenarios and, and, and thesis ideas as to how uh, organisms, living organisms, can be transferred between celestial bodies uh, in such a way as they, um, uh, they literally splash down uh, you know, between planets and so on. But when it comes to the human question and so on, we, 
you know, we're of the opinion, um, and probably Ted here can sort of explain that probably better than I can, where we need, uh, you know, basically a time machine to really understand how that might have uh, taken place. Yeah. Uh, in the book, Ted, you're talking about splash saltations as a possible, um, you know, answer to this problem of how one uh, strain of, of life they've been talking about have managed to get to the other. Tell us about this, Ted. Splash saltations are one possibility which we mention, you know, and I believe we're probably the first couple of people that, are, that have put that idea forward. Basically, um, it would be very hard to have two planets get close enough that, that you know, water and living creatures in the water would simply get torn off of one planet and land on the other. I mean, it's possible, right? But, I mean, I wouldn't bet money on anything like that ever having happened. Nonetheless, what Troy is proposing is that you get these electromagnetic flux tubes, you know, or Birkeland currents stretched between planetary bodies, and these things can carry water and material, right? In other words, for a creature passing through something like that from one world to another would be like going through a straw. You know, that would be possible. You know, that, that, that would be... I mean, you couldn't say that was the best protection you'd ever have for a, for, for a long-distance journey like that, but, I mean, it would be a certain amount of protection. Um, From radiation and stuff like I that you're talking about. In the case of the Cambrian explosion, I would say that was a candidate for a splash saltation. In the case, you know, also of the uh, Cenozoic mammals, you know, I would regard that as another possible case in point for splash saltations. When you start talking about humans getting from Ganymede to this planet, I wouldn't bet money that way, uh, okay? I mean, we don't have a time machine. We don't really know how humans got from Ganymede to this planet. W what we do know is that the Saturnian part of the system had approached the sun, not in a straight line, which is what you would picture, but in, in the form of a spiral motion, and that these spirals had points of near contact. And th then, in other words, the Saturnian system would swing into a point of near contact with the sun's solar system, and then swing back out into deep space again. You know, this answers one of the big questions, which we believe we've answered. In other words, you know, we're not proposing an exact mechanism for transferring living creatures from Ganymede or from the Jupiter moon system to Earth. What we are claiming is that, like, you know, whatever form these transfers took, they would have occurred at these points of near intersection, you know, where the spiral brought the Saturnian system in close. So that you would have had this um, the, the, this transfer of what you call Cromanian people to Earth, and then the Saturnian system would have swung back out into deep space again, so that any chance of these guys getting back home would have been lost. You know, and the next time that you had these the Saturnian system swing into close proximity to the solar system, you know, some thousands of years had, had gone by, right? At the point of the, this is. One of the big questions which we believe we've answered is the relationship between the Cro-Magnon people and the familiar antediluvian people of Genesis. In other words, we believe they're the exact same genetic stock, but that by the time the, the, this period of thousands of years had, had gone by, and you get a second group of people transferring from Ganymede to the Earth, then the culture and technology is, uh, had totally changed. So the relationship between Cromanian people and the familiar Bible antediluvians is going to be that they're genetically the same, but that the original cultures and technologies were completely and totally different. Uh, and like I said, that, that's the part of the thing that we believe we have answered. There's another part of this picture which we haven't really gone into much so far, which is the question of, you know, an aquatic existence and Elaine Morgan's thesis and you know, what exactly it is about Ganymede being a water world, which would have been so good for human development. Um, Elaine if Morgan... I just, if, if, if I could just interject there, just to add to what you're saying. Um, in Cosmos and Collision, uh, pretty much my end uh, of what I was um, contributing to the, the project was to simply find a plausible world where human life could exist where humans are, were, would have been well adapted, and that's why Ted's moving us into, you know, looking at the uh, aquatic ape uh, hypothesis of um, Elaine Morgan, uh, in, you know, in terms of Ganymede having been a uh, almost purely a liquid uh, water world uh, as such. Um, but the the idea of um, 
you know, providing a mechanism for the, the, the literal exchange of human life between uh, Ganymede, which we're proposing, and Earth, uh, from which we know humans existed during this um, darkened time uh, under Saturn. Uh, you know, it's probably for a later work, but I would probably suggest for, for listeners who might be frustrated, we don't go into this into the book, but I would point them to the idea that uh, uh, Rupert Sheldrake, um, the uh, Cambridge uh, biologist, uh, is uh, developing uh, in his concepts called um, morphic fields, the idea that nature does things by habit, and as a result, uh, nature encompassing you know, basically the whole universe, the, uh, the template uh, for the, the human um, uh, type being, the, the, the human species, uh, it could basically have arrived via a morphic process uh, and literally have been devolved down from this template that exists in, you know, basically a higher uh, plane. Uh, this, is, this is often... Um, how can we say this is uh, discussed in certain you know Hindu uh, type thinking mm-hmm. and so on. This idea of being devolved rather than evolved down from a uh, a higher energy source. Um, so you know there is the possibility. There's a there's a lot of stuff to explore. But what we were very happy about was that we had found uh, this world uh, that was predominantly a water world and very much suited. Uh, uh, you know, a better understanding for a place that could serve as the origins uh, for humans because uh, it would seem Ganymede uh, in this antique solar system epoch would have been far better for, uh, you know, the, the a- a- adapted um, traits of, uh, of humans. And, and let's talk a little bit more about that then, what the, the conditions, uh, what they were as opposed to how they are today. I mean, we, we can pose this question of if we went to Ganymede today, would we find... Uh, traces of of life there, and uh, if not, if the conditions are so radically different, uh, how what was it like once uh, on this aquatic world on Ganymede, Troy? Well, well, um, that um, that question first, I you know I think okay, number one, we can say as a blanket term that it was a water world, okay, but you know, in um, in my discussions with Ted, Ted introduced me to this aquatic ape hypothesis. I'd, I'd never known about this uh, concept uh, beforehand. And uh, what that does, if you get a sense of what type of world Ganymede uh, um, was, the question is more what type of world did it need to be uh, to you know, be applicable uh, to human origins. And uh, that's basically where the aquatic ape uh, hypothesis um, uh, came into play in our own writings. Uh, Ted, you want to talk a little bit more about that? I mean, I've heard about that before, the aquatic ape theory and, and this kind of... Uh, uh, you know, primarily the existence of, of the apes was like in, in the water and fishing and things like that. And, and so what was the conditions like, do you think? Okay, I mean, this is a fabulous topic. Um, you know, as far as I can tell, reading about Elaine Morgan, I, I mean, basically she has the most plausible theory that's ever been put forward as far as, you know, human adaptation and the original conditions under which humans must have lived. Nobody has ever, it's never been accepted in, in regular academia, and there really are just two reasons. I mean, there's a small reason that says that nobody, nobody's ever really found any sort of a, like an intermediate step in, in any sort of a process like that, anything that you would actually call an aquatic ape. You know, granted, it's hard to find bones underneath the water. Right, but the the biggest problem is simply that there's never been a body of water on this planet which would be safe for humans to live in, right? I mean, there there are a million and one reasons why humans don't live in water, right? I mean, you for for every reason that you have like that now, there would have been more than one reason like 40, 50, 60, 100,000 years ago, right? I mean, you only have to spend 15 minutes in in the ancient sea monster section of the Smithsonian Museum and, and you know, you, you get a pretty good idea as to why humans didn't live in water originally. But <laughs> yeah. nonetheless, nonetheless, we are absolutely adapted for, for life in water. It's like the most visible, you know, Lane Morgan lists, you know, a, a hundred or so characteristics which we share with the aquatic mammals. You know, the most obvious visible difference between ourselves and monkeys and apes is our legs being the major limbs, right? All monkeys and apes' arms are the, their major limbs. A monkey trying to swim the way that we do would simply turn somersaults in the water. Okay, having our legs be the major limbs is an adaptation for swimming and wading. 
Voluntary control over breathing, that's something we take for granted. You know, it's an adaptation for living in water. And monkeys and apes don't have it. In other words, that's the only reason that they can't teach chimpanzees and gorillas to speak English. They can teach them deaf signs perfectly well, and some of the gorillas who have been taught deaf signs check out as having IQs in the 90 to 105 range. That's adequate for half the jobs in the world. Um, there, there's a whole list of things. The way human bodies use fat is exactly the same manner in which aquatic mammals' bodies use, use fat. Um, not having fur, I mean, some aquatic mammals have fur, others don't, right? But it's not necessary for an aquatic mammal. In most cases, fat is the main insulation layer that there is between, you know, the creature's interior and the water. Um, sweating, the way that we do, would be highly disadaptive for, for life on land. You know, there's just a whole lot of a whole list of things. Face to face sex, right? I mean, aquatic mammals do that. And, you know, we're the only creature on land that does that. Um, <laughs> so, so that you've got a creature which is primarily adapted to living in water, but you know, no recorded history of it. No, no way to believe that humans could have, you know, evolved in water or been created in water on this planet, and. Basically, this, I think, is what makes Ganymede, I mean, not just a plausible world, but a perfect world for human prehistory, right? We've we basically come up with Elaine Morgan's perfect world. Well, it's a really fascinating theory, and uh, I think that there's, a, there's obviously a whole lot more to it that we're going to you know, continue talking about here a bit later but there are a few more things we can just kind of squeeze in there before we take a short break that if we just for a moment talk about the time frames and the, the scales involving uh you know hominids and modern man and and basically try to get a little closer to this question of how old uh man actually is and and what time frame the neanderthals actually might be developed under ted is this something that uh, uh differs vastly from what we know from the official world today what their theories are or what's what's your idea about the time frame here um Beyond some points you're guessing, um, the limitation of radiocarbon dating is about 45 or 50,000 years. Beyond that, nothing should radiocarbon date. Uh, you know, every sort of a dating scheme which anybody uses for anything pretty much is based on assumptions. These assumptions usually involve uniformitarianism. That's a big word, right? Uniformitarianism. <laughs> okay, just the idea that the processes which we observe at work in the world today are the only ones which there ever could have been. Okay, once you allow for there ever having been any sort of a planetary scale catastrophe like the flood or like the catastrophe which Velikovsky posited as having occurred something like 3,500 years ago, there's no real way to know what the ratio of carbon isotopes would have been prior to that. Okay, um, as far as, um, you know, our, our book has a couple of chapters like in the first 40 pages or so, which go into questions of evolution and dating schemes. And basically the main idea that we try to get across is that you have to take all these ideas of time with a certain, you know, with a grain of salt. Yeah. And there's no way to believe that our Earth is like six or 10,000, you know, our Earth is obviously, it's a great deal older than six or 10,000 years, but beyond that, you're just guessing. Okay, well, we have the one planet in our system, which is fairly new, which is Venus, right? And you know, that, you know, that planet really is ballpark for some kind of a six or 10,000 year age estimate. You know, but it looks like it. It's got, you know, Venus has like a 900 degree Fahrenheit surface temperature. It's got a 90 bar CO2 atmosphere. A 90 bar atmosphere means that like a three mile an hour wind would knock you over. It would be just like a wave at the beach. Okay. I mean, a wave only has to be moving at three or four miles an hour to knock people over. Right. Um, it has a massive thermal imbalance, at least according to raw data, massive upwards infrared flux. I mean, the Earth and Mars don't look like that, right? So that you have to, to assume that the Earth and Mars are substantially older than that. But, you know, like I said, beyond some point, it's just a guessing game. As far as hominids, I mean, the standard theories say that Neanderthals were kicking around anywhere from two, three, four hundred thousand 400,000 years ago up until about 30,000 years ago. Um, Cro-Magnon man, most people believe, appeared on the Earth about 45,000 years ago. <clears throat> and I think Troy and I would assume that Neanderthal, or, or the Cro I'm sorry, the Cro-Magnon people had gotten here somewhere back, you know, substantially longer period of time ago than the antediluvians of Genesis. 
right? The antediluvians of Genesis, you figure maybe three, 4,000 years ago, starting from now, right? Um, human interaction with Neanderthals. I mean, the Neanderthal disappeared in a wave going from east to west as it came into contact with, with modern humans, at least in Europe, right? I mean, the, the final Neanderthal stand in Europe was like in caves in southern Spain. And most people assume that that took place about 25,000 years ago, 27,000 years ago. Uh-huh, yep. Um, you still have, um, I, don't, I don't know if I should use the term racial memories, but you've got folklore memories amongst the Spanish Basque of something which looks entirely like Danny Vendermini's Neanderthal, which they call Basilwan. Okay, it means forest lord, and, and which is typically described as being pretty much a hominid, just hugely musculature with red fur, and, you know, typically would be seen walking around with a spear in his hand. I mean, that's basically Danny Vendramini's Neanderthal, right? So that, you know, this would have been the last group that had major contact with, with Neanderthals in Europe. Well, that's really interesting. That shows that it's been uh, contact, uh, you know, way back, basically, and and, and, and all these things are, are kind of... Uh, uh, thrown out. You you guys have an interesting section also about the memory of, of of dinosaurs with with petroglyphs being in there. That's something I want to talk about in in the second. I think we should take a break at this point and then continue talking more here in a little bit. Uh, uh, some fascinating ideas, a completely new concept, one that I haven't heard about before. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Why don't we give out the website, guys? And and uh, Troy, you can just tell us a little bit about where people can go to pick up a copy of the the book, and then we can give out your individual websites as well after that. Sure. Well, um, Ted and I have released the book as a Kindle um, at this time that you can uh, buy off uh, uh, Amazon. And uh, we have a website, uh, uh, cosmosandcollision.com, uh, that uh, highlights the book and gives uh, some basic information with, um, with a link to where you can buy it. Uh, and uh, yeah, anybody looking to uh, look uh, into the greater detail into what we're talking about here uh, should get themselves a copy. Absolutely. Fascinating. Some Cosmos in Collision. And then, uh, Troy, of course, don't forget your uh, other website for your Saturn Death Cult. That's right, Saturn Death Cult, where, where I have a sort of introduction to Saturn theory, uh, you know, that people can sort of look at it at a, at a basic uh, level. And uh, what I should say as well is that uh, what both um, websites and, and really both uh, uh, Kindle books uh, share is that Ted and I have um, taken a lot of time to heavily illustrate uh, what we um, what we are proposing. So the illustrations, you're not just uh, simply being hit over the head with a block of uh, text uh, and such, but uh, the illustrations uh, lend to, uh, you know, hopefully a m producing a more understanding on the part of readers. Uh, and uh, I would say as well, this is a lot more, Cosmos and Collision is a lot more academically robust uh, than what I did in Saturn Death Cult. And, uh, you know, it goes as far as even to offer um, not only arguments in terms of uh, origins of, of humans, but we also uh, discuss at length uh, the physics involved in, in how these uh, disparate uh, planetary bodies came into contact with each other and, and their relationships to each other. Indeed, uh, there are some great is illustrations in the book, uh, uh, as the same with your previous uh, work, uh, Troy. They're always a great addition, of course, to explain some of these difficult concepts. Uh, before I take a break as well, Ted, uh, you also have a personal website. Give us the URL to your uh, beer factory website. <laughs> okay, bearfabrique.org. Okay, like a bear in the woods, B-E-A-R. And then the ordinary word for factory, like in French or German or Russian, fabrique, French spelling, F-A-B-R-I-Q-U-E. So bearfabrique, F-A-B-R-I-Q-U-E dot org. Um, the Kindle book, I, I, I think, is probably our best shot, at least at first, right? It's like you don't even have to have a Kindle to read those kinds of things. Uh, Amazon has a Kindle book reader available for PCs, for Macs, and it's a free download, and cosmosandcollision.com provides a link to that. So the, the, it's, the, you know, that shouldn't be a hang-up or, or anything like that. The, the Kindle format is a sort of a revolution. It's like being a kid turned loose in a candy store, or something like that, where everything is either free or very cheap. I mean, you, you can all of a sudden afford all the books that you wanted ever, you know, not, not only in terms of money, but in terms of space, right? I mean, you don't have, like, thousands of pounds of books sitting around there, or at least you don't need to. That's right. <laughs> anymore, just about anything that I've been looking for recently is just there and, 
you know, in numbers and profusion to make to, uh, as you get larger, right? I mean, you'll remember from school, it was always the littlest kid in your classroom who could do the most push-ups or pull-ups or any kind of a ratio exercise, you know, and that is because, you know, weight is proportional to volume, which is a cubed figure, and strength is proportional to cross-section of bones and muscles, which is a squared figure. If you were to double your physical dimensions, then you've got a factor of two, which gets figured three times for volume and weight, width, breadth, height, two, four, eight, you're going to be eight times heavier. But that factor of two only gets squared for cross-section and for strength, right? You're only going to be four times stronger. You'll have cut your power-to-weight ratio in half, and... Obviously, you can only cut your power to weight ratio in half so many times and still stand up and walk. And it is possible to figure a mathematical limit for that sort of thing for the planet. In other words, you can simply use the two-thirds power body weight scaling factor, which is used for Olympic lifting events. And you, you can simply solve for the point at which one of our strongest human athletes would become dysfunctional due to this um, the squared cube problem in the case of a like one of your world's strongest man competitors or a power lifter like Kazmaier or Mark Chalet or somebody like that, then you can simply figure, you know, okay, take a um, thousand pound squat or deadlift, figure weight is going to be equal to, you know, the thousand pounds plus 350 pounds of the athlete, divide that by the two thirds power of 350 pounds, and simply set that equal to prehistory of our solar system our planet and of modern man. Uh, there's some really interesting and big points here. And, I, and Troy, there, there are a lot of, you know, somewhat complicated themes in the book. And, and I think it would be good to just do a, a broad stroke outline here, an overview, if you will, in the beginning of some of the bigger questions that you guys are, are trying to answer. To, uh, so let's uh, get to it. Yeah, well, um, I sort of got to know Ted. Uh, I, I knew of him before he actually contacted me after I'd released uh, the Saturn Death Cult uh, book, which gives an introduction to a theory called Saturn Theory. And uh, Ted had contacted me specifically to do with uh, the more ancient uh, aspects of that theory, the um, cosmology involved in that. But I knew of his work through uh, the works of Duardo Cardona, one of the um, main advocates of uh, Saturn Theory, who's put out a number of books. So it was quite a pleasant surprise to... Um, uh, you know, to come into contact with Ted, and uh, over time we started to develop some very interesting discussions that uh, led to a decision that we would, uh, you know, co-author a book, um, Cosmos and Collision, that was uh, written mainly as an investigation into the question of human origins in the uh, context of Saturn theory. Now, to understand what brought me and Ted together, uh, one, one has to understand what Saturn theory is and how Saturn theory relates to the question of human origins. When Ted contacted me, he was most interested in the element of uh, Saturn theory relating to a time uh, dubbed the Purple Dawn of Creation. This was a semi It have been different with the gravity if we go back in time. Is that, is that what it, this is pointing to? That's correct. In other words, there's no way to believe that large dinosaurs experience gravity the way that we do at all. You know, they'd be crushed by our present gravity. There, there are other kinds of problems. I mean, you have thousand-pound flying creatures in the ancient world. The, the largest creatures which can take off the land on our present world are 25, 30 pounds. You know, albatrosses and um, burkut eagles, right, those kinds of things. But, I mean, that's about the limit. You know, they've tried to breed burkuts for size and strength for thousands of years, and, and the largest they can get them up to is about 25 pounds. Beyond that point, they can't take off easily. Hmm. Um, you had territories in ancient times which were like a 200-pound golden eagle, you know, with a 25-foot wingspan. Then you've got these Texas Big Bend pterosaurs, which, you know, appear to have been in the neighborhood of 1,000 pounds, wingspans 50, 60 feet. You know, if, if you're built like that, I mean, they have to live by flying. You, you can't have wings like that and just walk around. You know, that, that's not a reasonable lifestyle. I mean, in fact, in other words, the birds who, the surviving large birds, you know, which made it past the change in gravity, did so by having the wings become vestigial, like ostriches, moas. Right. You know, those kinds of things, right? It's like they don't fly, but, you know, they're not dragging 50-foot wings around either. 
Yeah, it's a f fascinating point. I think many haven't uh, thought about it that before, and I'm sure that these uh, ideas, of course, is something that we'll tie into later in our discussion. Mm -hmm. Now, if we if we shift our focus then to uh, Cosmos in Collision. A, a person just lifting himself up off the ground, x divided by the two-thirds power of x and solve for x, so I should get a number right around 20,000 pounds. That would be the extreme mathematical limit for the planet. Now, in actual reality, the largest elephants are about... 14,000, 15,000 pounds, and that's like 1% of elephants. And it's probably the case that when an elephant gets to that size, that he has to stay on his feet for the rest of his life. If he gets off of his feet at that point, he's not going to get back upon them. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. This says that, you know, this is the real world limit for uh, our present world, right? In other words, there, there would be a question which says that if you look at dinosaurs and their sizes, uh, and that those sizes were supposed to be such a winning ticket for creatures which dominated the Earth for tens of millions of years, then you've got a question as to why within the, the 65 million years, which supposedly separates their age from ours, nothing else has ever re-evolved to those sizes. You know, the answer is simply that they can't. In other words, if you were to give Steven Spielberg a... Um, a time machine and allow him to drag one of your large sauropod dinosaurs into the parking lot or, or the street. I mean, you wouldn't start walking around chasing people. It would collapse in a heap and it'd suffocate. Uh, really, is all that would happen. It wouldn't take <laughs> one, a couple of minutes. Right. It's exactly the same thing that happens if a whale gets beached or somebody, for some reason, drags a blue whale up onto land and suffocates, right? I mean, he can't even support the weight of his own lungs. That's incredible. So just to clarify that for listeners who doesn't understand maybe just the math alone behind that, the point there is that something must... Hi, Troy. Thanks for coming back on the program. It's good to talk to you again. Hope you're uh, doing well over in the uh, UK. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to be back, uh, Henrik. Always enjoy uh, being on the show and uh, looking forward to it. Definitely. It's always a lot of fun, a lot of big uh, questions and big themes. And we're going to get to some of those today as well. We also have uh, Ted with us, of course, uh, your co-author. Thanks for coming on with us uh, today, Ted. Good to have you with us. My pleasure. Now, you know, before we get into the main topic here, uh, you know, the meat of the discussion, I thought we'd just spend a, a few minutes or so on, on your background, Ted, since you're new to the program. We could just kind of introduce you a little bit to our audience. I was just curious to hear briefly about the, the math work that you've been doing re in regards to uh, you know, dinosaurs, uh, gravity, and basically some of these unanswered uh, questions. Tell us just li a little bit about this, Ted. Okay, everything that I've ever done along these lines, you know, amounts to hobby shop uh, projects. Uh, I mean, I I've earned my living as a, as a computer software developer. You can't, you can't be in a position where your livelihood depends on any sort of an academic thing and take some of the positions I've taken, right? You either have to be independently wealthy or you have to be doing something else for a living. Um, as far as studying gravity and dinosaurs, basically that goes back to the early 80s. And you, what I had come up with at that time was the fact that you could simply use the kinds of scaling which they use for Olympic weightlifting events to get a ballpark figure for, for a size limit for the planet. You know, in other words, there, there, there's a problem that you get into.